Welcome to the Paisa Solar Festival webinar. Our guest today, Malvin Artley. Uh, good evening, Malvin. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining uh, our circle today. And we really grateful for your upcoming sharing. Um, in this time of the Pisces full moon. So please, floor is yours. Okay. Um, now I need to be able to share the screen. So that's, um, now you should be able to show you your screen. Mm. Here we go. Okay, well, welcome everyone. We find ourselves in a very interesting situation in the world these days. Uh, we've had a turning point in the past years. Uh, and we'll get to why and where it will be leading us. The main topics for today uh, that are especially important in this world period are economics, uh, politics, culture, education, and climate, which uh, a good number of the populace seems to want to deny at this point. But um, to preface these points, we'll start with a brief overview of what's confronting us from now until 2025, and then move on to a brief overview of the present astrological age from which we're passing, which is Pisces. Um, so I'll leave these pages up briefly so you can see them. There are 15 references to 2025 in all of Alice Bailey's books and I've highlighted the key points here. Um, the first book that came out, A Treatise on Cosmic Fire, uh, was an expansion on the teaching given in the Secret Doctrine on the Three Fires. And it was an awaited sequence. It also presented the psychological key to the secret doctrine and is intended to offer study to disciples and initiates at the close of this century and the beginning of the next century up until 2025. That's from Discipleship in the New Age, page 779. Um, above everything else required at this time is a recognition of the world of meaning, a recognition of those who implement world affairs and who engineer those steps which lead mankind onwards towards its destined, destined goal, plus a steadily increasing recognition of the plan on the part of the masses. This is the biggest thing that confronts us now, is, is waking the masses up to exactly what's happening. These three recognitions must be evidenced by humanity and affect human thinking and action if the total destruction of mankind is to be averted. They must form the theme of all the propaganda work to be done during the next few decades up until 2025, a brief space of time indeed. Uh, at 2025, the fourth ray will begin, begin to come slowly into manifestation. Uh, and it's said that we only need more light in the esoteric sense in order to see the soul and that light will shortly be available and we shall understand the meaning of the words and in that light we, shall we see light. This intensification of light will continue until 2025. Uh, this intensi intensification of the light is the reason we're seeing so much upheaval in the world these days and all the departments that uh, I mentioned before especially. Uh, the World Federation of Nations will eventually be equally well organized by 2025, uh, with, well, with this outer form taking rapid shape by 2025. Uh, don't infer from this that we shall have a perfected world religion and complete community of nations, not so rapidly does nature move. But the concept and the idea will be universally recognized, universally desired, and generally worked for. Uh, uh, also, at 2025, there's supposed to be future teaching uh, around astrology, especially. The next reference, uh, let me move this out of the way. I 
just bear with me a second. Okay, uh, we have now the difficult task of considering an aspect of divine manifestation which is yet so little apparent upon the physical plane that we lack the exact word with which to express it. And those words available are likewise misleading. I can, however, attempt to give you certain concepts, relationships, and parallels which may serve to close this section on astrology and lay a foundation for the future teaching. This is what was referenced about astrology, astrology before. I've made this political application in this immediate illustration of teaching about glamour. This is from uh, externalization of the hierarchy. Glamour, illusion, and Maya because the whole world problem has reached a crisis today and because its clarification will be the outstanding theme of all progress, educational, religious, and economic, until 2025. Thus, a great new movement is proceeding and tremendously increased interplay and interaction is taking place. Uh, during the years intervening between now and then, very great changes will be seen taking place. I think we can all agree with that one. And at the great assembly of the hierarchy held as usual every century, uh, this time in 2025, the date in all probability will be set for the first stage of the externalization of the hierarchy. We can go on. Um, it will, be a, it will become apparent why the day of opportunity has only just arrived. The East has preserved rules for us since uh, time immemorial about initiation, discipleship, and so forth. And there, here and there, Orientals with a few Western adepts have availed themselves of those rules and have submitted to the discipline of this exacting science. Uh, The spiritual life has steadily flowed westward, and we may look for a con corresponding climax in the west, which will reach its zenith between the years 1965 and 2025. What we've seen during this period is the, the great expansion of um, Hindu, uh, or Hindu and Buddhist schools, in other words, the trans-Himalayan schools spreading throughout the west, which has made available uh, a great deal of information to us. And finally, uh, bread as a symbol of material human need will eventually be controlled by a vast group of initiates of the first initiation, by those whose lives are beginning to be controlled by the Christ consciousness, which is the consciousness of responsibility and service. These initiates ex exist in their thousands today, and they'll be present in their millions by the time 2025 arri arrives. Okay, so moving on. Along with the spiritual uh, predictions for 2025 or the outlay that we have, there are also other predictions. Uh, we'll have greatly increased computing speed um, approaching that of the human brain, uh, and the cost will only be very small comparatively. We'll have a tree and sensor economy, uh, which means there'll be sensors in everything. We'll get to a little bit more of that later. There'll be perfect knowledge. In other words, uh, knowledge will be readily accessible. All the existing knowledge we have at the touch of a button, basically. Uh, there'll be 8 billion hyper-connected people. Uh, it's been said that this will happen, especially by 2030. Uh, it's also predicted uh, there'll be a disruption of healthcare, uh, augmented and virtual reality, or uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, this refers to the days of Jarvis. So if anyone has seen the movie Iron Man, we have blockchain, which is the basis of Bitcoin, and we'll have catastrophic collapses. All this is predicted. Uh, we see in this map here, the projected water scarcity, for instance, in 2025, and we see basically along the equatorial belt here, that water will be quite scarce. Uh, the yellow areas are economic water scarcity. In other words, the, the economic need will outweigh the availability of water. So we see, we'll see water rates 
going up quite a bit. The tipping points that were talked about um, relate to the uh, so-called threat that China poses to uh, U.S. interests. And if we take a look at this map here, we begin to see why uh, the U.S. as the world hegemon as it's been is so concerned about this. Uh, we'll get to this more in the political section a little bit later, but you can see that with all this interconnection, this forms a huge economic block. It will be the biggest in the world when it's completed, if it's not disrupted. And they go on to, to outline, the RAND Corporation goes on to outline what this means. They're saying by 2025, enhanced Chinese counterforce measures and platforms will have shrunk the, ga the gap between Chinese and U.S. military losses. I'll stop here and say that uh, some of what we're going to be looking at, especially in terms of politics, uh, might be a bit disturbing to some, uh, some listeners, uh, especially if we've been heavily indoctrinated uh, with anti-Russia, anti-China, uh, anti-propaganda, in other words. The thing we have to re realize is we're moving toward a multipolar world, uh, not controlled by any one superpower. We see the, the, the number of U.S. bases here, uh, the number of troops all ring the uh, shipping passageways uh, from China to the rest of the world. This was uh, Obama's so-called pivot to the east, and the, the purpose was it, purpose of it was to disrupt or to contain Chinese shipping. Uh, we see all the countries where there are U.S. military bases. There are 800 military bases outside the U.S., uh, and that's not counting the 3,500 uh, military bases within the U.S. But in terms of the emerging world order, there's several points to be made. If you've looked at alternative media on the internet, uh, if you've been in chat rooms and all that, you, we've heard quite a bit about the new world order and how it's uh, how it gives a sort of dystopic vision of what it's going to be, like a, a central control that uh, enslaves humanity, all this uh, sort of conspiracy theory. In terms of what DK has given us, uh, through the Alice Bailey books, the New World Order must meet the immediate need and not be an attempt to satisfy some distant idealistic vision, uh, such as communism or a totally free market uh, into the future. Uh, the New World Order must be appropriate to the world which has passed through a destructive crisis. Uh, we had such a destructive crisis back uh, during the World War period from 1914 to 1945. Uh, we're going through another one now. Uh, appropriate to a world which has passed through a destructive crisis and to a humanity which is badly shattered by the experience. Going on, the new world order must lay the foundation for a future world order which will be possible only after a time of recovery, of reconstruction, and rebuilding. It will be founded on the recognition that all men are equal in origin and goal but that all are at different stages of evolutionary development. That personal integrity, intelligence, vision, experience, plus a marked goodwill should indicate leadership. Uh, it's hardly what we have today, but we're headed there. The domination of the proletariat over the aristocracy and bourgeoisie, as in Russia, or the domination of an entrenched aristocracy over the proletariat and middle classes, as has been until lately the case in Great Britain, must disappear. The control of labor by capital or the control of capital by labor must also go. 
In the new world order, the governing body in any nation should be composed of those who work for the greatest good and the greatest number and who at the same time offer opportunity to all, seeing to it that the individual is left free. So we can see we have a little ways to go to get to this point. The new world order will be founded on an active sense of responsibility. The rule will be all for one and one for all. Again, there won't be any one hegemony. The new world order will not impose a uniform type of government. A synthetic religion and a system of standardized standardization upon the nations. The sovereign rights of each nation will be recognized and its peculiar genius, individual trends and racial qualities will be permitted full expression. In one particular only should there be an attempt to produce unity and that will be in the field of education. The New World Order will recognize that the produce of the world, the natural resources, such as oil, for instance, of the planet and its riches belong to no one nation, but should be shared by all. Uh, there will be no nations under the category of haves and others under the opposite category. In the preparatory period for the New World Order, there will be a steady and regulated disarmament. This will not be optional instead of the arms races that we see today. These are the simple and general premises upon which the new world order must begin its work. These preliminary stages must be kept fluid and experimental. The vision of possibility must never be lost and the foundations must be preserved inviolate. So we get an idea of where we're headed. This leads us to the age from which we're passing. And in the transition between the, the great astrological ages, there's always this period of upheaval, of change. We saw this between the uh, ages of Aries and, and Pisces with the fall of the Roman Empire. Uh, with the ending of the Piscean Age, uh, which is brought to the point of crystallization and therefore of death, all those forms through which the Piscean ideas have been molded, uh, we see the ending of the idea of authority, the position of the different forms of paternalism upon the race. Uh, we saw this particularly with the colonial powers as the so-called white man's burden. Uh, so this paternalism is applied in political, educational, social, and religious paternalism. It can be either kindly uh, or the paternalism of the churches, the religions uh, expressing his authority, or the paternalism of an educational process. Pisces also gave us the idea of the value of sorrow and pain in the process of teaching the race of the necessary quality of detachment. In other words, that its desire and plans shall no longer be oriented to form living. The guides of the race have emphasized the idea of the virtues of sorrow and the educational values. To the above, must be coupled the idea of self-sacrifice. Uh, this is like uh, giving one's life for one's country, in other words, giving one's life to an ideal. Um, such ideals are apt to forget that the only true sacrifice is that which is self-initiated. And that when it's an enforced sacrifice imposed by the more powerful and superior person or group, it is apt to be, in the last analysis, the coercion of the individual and his enforced submission to a stronger will. This we see beginning to pass out very quickly. The Piscean age has been the age of material production of commercial expansion of the salesmanship of the products of human skill, which the general public is educated to believe are essential to happiness. Uh, the whole purpose of this has been to bring people to a point of satiety. In other words, uh, to learn the lesson that uh, material goods and progress do not bring happiness.
So that's what pass that's what's passing out. Uh, when we consider Pisces, it transmits rays two and six, but also two major rays express themselves through the rulers of Pisces, which is, are uh, Jupiter and Pluto. Uh, Pluto transmitting the first ray of will or power, and Jupiter the second ray. It produces the duality of the sign, brings about the major problems. Uh, the major problem being psychic sensitivity, and it causes the lure of the path. In the first instance, it's the path of evolution, and later the lure of the probationary path with the consequence that transference to the fixed cross begins really in Pisces. Uh, it precipitates the process of transmutation and eventual escape through death. It unfolds the significance, activity, and beauty of death and the work of the destroyer. Now, if we look at the natural horoscope, Pisces rules the natural 12th house, which is the house of institutions. It's also one of the houses of death. It's the house of the dissolution of the personality. Uh, in modern astrology, it's often called the house of self-undoing but it's also the house of accumulated wisdom. Pisces is ruled by Jupiter in the Orthodox and Pluto in the esoteric and hierarchical. Uh, through its Orthodox ruler, that force is brought to bear, which brings all together. Um, as we saw with the churches in the Piscean age, in this case, uh, but in this particular case, it relates the two fishes and binds them together in a functioning relationship. Now, with Pisces, we what we're actually dealing with uh, on the spiritual path is the the uh, dissolution of the bond between the soul and the personality, and also the the soul on its own plane, and the monad or or the spiritual essence. It has its influence focused through Neptune. Now, this particular aspect of uh, Pisces has not been really fully explored, but uh, it's something I've looked at in the past few years, and it's especially um, interesting by the fact that Pluto is actually tied in with the orbit of Neptune through orbital resonance. In, in fact, in the early days of the solar system, Neptune was migrated out to the outer edges of the solar system and it captured uh, certain planets within its orbital um, uh, its gravitation basically uh, which controls the the orbital resonance pluto is one of those little planets and there's a group of planets called plutinos and plutoids i draw a distinction between the two names and there are three of them that are named uh, besides Pluto, we have Orcus, Ixan, and Huia. There are quite a number of them, actually, uh, but the ones that are named are particularly important because they all have similar effects. Uh, they all work with the process of uh, death. They also work with the process of clarification. And we can see the relative sizes of these Plutinos here. Charon is, is actually the moon of Pluto, so we see that it's Pluto's moon is actually larger than these other Plutinos. Uh, Orcus has a specific relationship with keeping one on the path. It's uh, like the drill instructor. It's the disciplinarian, I call it. And it relates to a person holding to their uh, higher ethic holding to their vows, especially the vows they make to themselves. And when it's activated in a chart, it means that you don't get away with anything. Like if you have uh, Orcus on an angle, uh, karma comes around very quick uh, in a matter of speaking. So, so if, you, if you're not on your path, you're brought into a recognition of the fact very quickly. Ixan is called the uh, malcontent and in effect it's the it has a very 
clarifying effect on the lower aspect of the mind, the concrete mind, and also the emotions. Uh, Huya is a very interesting little planet in, in that it, it deals with extremism. Uh, it brings back uh, a sense of balance, and Huya was very active in the last two years. We saw the rise of uh, Daesh or ISIS. Uh, the extremism that we saw with uh, the um, Islamic State in Levant and all the horrors that went on there. Uh, Plutinos have an orbital resonance of two to three, but there are many others, and some of the best known named planets of the other resonances connected with Neptune are Eris and Haumea. Uh, I won't go into those there here, but uh, to make a point, Neptune through controlling the orbits of these planets also has a connection with um, how they operate. In other words, the, the Platinos through their first ray action clear the path toward the higher realizations. They, they, they clear a path as toward Buddhi, which Neptune actually rules. Neptune is called pure reason. This is what we mean when we say that Neptune focuses the, uh, the power of Pisces. In other words, it leads us to the, what Buddhists would call the, the, the union of calm abiding and insight. It brings us to true intuition, which is recognition of truth as a whole and not in a part it's a it's a blissful experience and we could say that neptune is the the, the planet of bliss um there's also another little planet called maki maki uh as another resonance but going on with, uh, with pisces it's, it's a dual sign it's in the mutable cross uh, represented by the fishes tied together by a cord it governs the feet and hence the whole thought, the thought of progress, of attaining the goal and of treading the path of return. Uh, the duality of Pisces must be studied in relation to its three keynotes, which are bondage uh, or captivity, renunciation or detachment, sacrifice and death. This dual bondage is brought to an end by what's called the final death, when the complete release of the life aspect from the life of the form takes place. It's also related to the other signs in the mutable cross, uh, Gemini, Virgo, and Sagittarius. I have to go very quickly over this. We have a very interesting diagram here. Some of you may recognize it. This is the, uh, the path to Shunyata or calm abiding. And if you count the number of elephants here, which represents the lower mind, there are nine of them. We start with Aries, we go up to Sagittarius, which is the one pointed disciple. Then going across the Rainbow Bridge, we have Aquarius coming back from the Rainbow, you know, across the Rainbow Bridge, the Rainbow Bridge indicating the connection between the soul and the personality or the cord binding the two fishes and finally we have Pisces where the cord is broken uh, represented by the the monk carrying the rainbow able to uh, transcend the laws uh, of uh, nature and matter very interesting study The path that leads to Pisces, as shown by the, the, the diagram we just saw, uh, are called the initiations of the threshold, of uh, the first two. They're not actually classed as major, initiation, major expansions of consciousness at all. And when it's said that uh, there will be millions of initiates by 2025, it's talking about these 
first two initiations, the first one in, uh, especially. In Tibetan, they're called the path of accumulation and the path of purification. These govern the stage of, uh, of aspiring bodhicitta. Uh, we, we hear about aspirants and disciples very often in Alice Bailey's books. And these lead to the first major expansion of consciousness or, or the third initiation, the transfiguration, which is the realization of ultimate bodhicitta. And Pluto uh, actually governs this ultimate bodhicitta or the opening of it, I should say, uh, through the base chakra, which Pluto has an association with. Uh, the first major initiation, the, the third initiation is called the very joyous. It's governed by Capricorn. The, the next one, okay. The next one is the the stainless, which is Aquarius. Uh, I'll make this document available so you can go back and review it. And then the path of no more learning uh, is governed by Pisces. Uh, again, I have to watch the time here, so a lot of this, because I want to get to what we're actually dealing with in the world. One of the major areas that we're facing now is, is a great economic upheaval. You know, we've heard a lot about the, the coming economic crash, uh, and this could goes back to the introduction of uh, fiat currency, especially in the U.S. with the petrodollar, which happened under, under Nixon's administration. The reason we're on the petrodollar now is because of the, the Vietnam War, basically, because the we were on the gold standard then. And at the end of the Vietnam War, it became increasingly difficult to pay off the debt. So Nixon had this brilliant idea, or the economists did. Uh, he took us off the gold standard, floated the dollar, and made a deal with the Saudis, uh, Saudi Arabia, to provide for their defense uh, in exchange for their taking on uh, government bonds, government debt, and supplying us with cheap oil. This is the reason why we have such a close relationship with Saudi Arabia now. As the fact that not many people know or have have studied, we're currently functioning under the neoliberal economic model, which is a model characterized by privatization, austerity, deregulation, free trade, and reductions in government spending in order to increase the role of the private sector in economic uh, in, in the economy and society. Um, what that's done, uh, everyone has seen it. Uh, I was living in Australia when this really took hold there. And the first thing you notice is they start privatizing all the, all the state industries like the water, the electricity, the gas. And the first thing after that you notice is that all the prices start to rise sharply. And the services aren't quite as good either. What you also get with this system is the, they, they cut taxes. Uh, neoliberal economics is often uh, associated with Reagan, Reaganomics or Thatcherism. It's the same thing. Fiat money has been defi defined variously under these terms, but it, it's intrinsically valueless money, used as money because of government decree. It depends on the solvency of the government as to whether or not the currency is any good. Uh, in other words, it's not based on any physical assets such as gold. Uh, the gold standard is a monetary system in which the standard economic 
unit of account is based on a fixed quantity of gold. Now, China and Russia have started going back to gold. They've been building up their reserves for a long time. The, this is going to have uh, carry on effects as we'll see. But if you want to see what cutting taxes does, here's a graphic that pretty well explains it. From 1947 to 1963, uh, the tax rate on the on the top 1% was 82%. And we see that the, the average household grew at an annual growth rate of around 2.5%. When they cut the taxes in 1964 under um, Johnson, we see how much that fell, almost 1%. The taxes were cut again under Reagan's watch uh, to 28%, and we see that growth has fallen actually to nil except for the 1% which is shot straight up. And there are further tax cuts uh, under the administrations from Clinton onward. Uh, from this graphic, we can see why the average American family, for instance, uh, can't even come up $400 in an emergency. There's, they have no savings anymore because there's been no growth of the middle class. It's all gone to the 1%. This is also going along with the national debt. We see the uh, this is w one of the key things that is really upsetting the American uh, economy, and one reason uh, why we see so much division in the U.S. and also why the U.S. empire, uh, economic empire, is about to implode on itself, especially when when we look these figures uh, because we were almost 1.3 trillion dollars in debt under uh, when Obama took office he eventually reduced it to about 700 trillion or 700 billion and now it's back um, to almost a trillion so the or the Republic especially have no interest in balancing the budget anymore and then you can look at all the the spending with the US uh, one of the biggest departments is defense and then you have uh, the revenues from taxes again I have to be mindful of time here one of the most blatant things is the, the discretionary federal, federal spending. This is what they, what they can choose to spend aside from Medicare and Social Security and uh, Medicaid. And we see the biggest slice of that goes to the military. Uh, that's just been upped since this time, since 2016 by $100 billion. Okay, so with the economic system we have today, the GDP growth has slowed. Half of the world has benefited from the industrial revolutions, the, the first two, half not. 40% of the world now makes less than $2 a day or less. 62 people own half of the world's wealth. That's an astounding number. Productivity is slowing. Unemployment's very high, especially among uh, millennials. We have the uh, the working poor, we have the, uh, the, the traveling retirees who, who are looking for work just to survive. We have slow productivity for the next 20 years, the growth of robotics, the need for a radically new economic and industrial model. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. We're moving toward a third industrial revolution, uh, which will include the Internet of Things. Uh, it will bypass the vertical integration that we have, which is a carryover from the Piscean Age. So we'll see direct person-to-person -person interaction. It's designed to be distributed, not centralized. 
uh, which goes back to the the emerging new world order. It works best when it's collaborative, transparent, and open. It will be laterally scaled, not vertically integrated. It enables each person to contribute their own talents, talents to the system. Uh, we have examples of this with open source programming, uh, and a lot of websites are run from this open source programming. Uh, uh, the problems inherent th with that are net neutrality, politiz politicization, government oversight and control, and so on and so forth. Uh, the new system is starting with the millennials, and it'll be an uphill battle to control these these problems, like preventing cyber crime, cyber terrorism, uh, defeating the the secret organizations. And all, all this within 30 to 40 years. Um, the thing that's becoming very clear is that nuclear and uh, petroleum energy has to go. It, be, it will be replaced by wind, solar, and ge geothermal. Uh, we have the biggest nuclear reactor in the solar system that rises and sets every day and that can supply all our energy needs from now until far, far into the future. Uh, China, Germany, and the Netherlands are already grasping uh, the new system. Uh, China is the, the leader now in uh, the new energy sources like wind, solar, and so forth. We're starting to see car sharing networks. Every For every new car in the sharing economy, it eliminates 15 privately owned cars. And millennials aren't buying cars. We also have the problem of uh, greenhouse gases, uh, and the three biggest contributors are the buildings, meat, and transport in that order. Uh, in terms of financing all this, everything has to be retrofitted. There'll be mass employment, that's employment, not unemployment, mass employment for the next two generations, which will be paid back by the savings in energy. And finally, we'll see a social economy that will gradually replace the current market economy. We talked about Saudi Arabia before and the petrodollar. Uh, just to give you an idea of why we're so tied in with Saudi Arabia and, and the Middle East. Uh, um, As of recently, they hold 125 billion of treasury securities, which are basically IOUs. Uh, this is the amount of oil we buy from them, or the amount of oil that we owe to them. Uh, they're closely followed by the United Arab Emirates, and these two countries are the ones that are currently leading the uh, war in Yemen. Uh, we also have Kuwait, Oman, Iraq, and all the usual suspects. We see uh, Qatar, Nigeria, and Bahrain are, are way down on the list. Now, a very interesting thing that's also not talked about is in 2008, the, the price of oil went up to $130 a barrel. And it's been said that this is what caused the financial collapse in 2008. Because the cost, uh, because of the cost of oil, it caused the prices of everything to rise sharply. And uh, along with the housing bubble that we had, uh, it caused that collapse. And we've been in an unstable situation ever since. Because of that, China started going back on the gold standard, uh, along with Russia and it's currently ceasing its building of U.S. currency reserves. Uh, if there is any major trouble with China, they will go off the dollar, uh, which will cause uh, a major upset in the U.S. economy and basically bring the system crashing down. Uh, this goes back to the Nixon years and the floating of the dollar and going off the gold standard. Uh, so we see that it 
at the time it was a brilliant move, but on the other hand, uh, it had the seeds of its own destruction in it. Because of the massive U.S. debt we have now, we, we find that this more than any other factor is the greatest threat to U.S. security. And the system is desperately trying to, um, to overcome that. I see I'm running out of time here. Um, so I'll just skip to a few other things. The, the basic, just the geopolitical situation now is that um, Russia has recently restored the balance of power uh, militarily in the world with its uh, announcement on March 1st of its new class of weapons, uh, which renders the, the missile protection capabilities that the US has developed obsolete, ineffective. Basically, we have come back to mutually uh, assured destruction again. And um, despite what it sounds like, as ter terrible as it sounds, it's actually, a better situation than what we had because it means that no one is going to press the button for fear of what it will produce. It means that we're going to have to come together and talk instead of rattling sabers and upsetting everyone. Uh, with the, the current situation in the Middle East trying to control the oil, we if we go back to the, the map of, of China and Europe with the Belt and Road Initiative that we saw, we see why we're in the Middle East and trying to disrupt that system. Uh, if we look at the collapse of the Soviet Union, we see what happened when Boris Yeltsin was president, the GDP dropped very uh, very sharply. When Vladimir Putin came in, it rose again and surpassed uh, the end of the Soviet uh, levels. And it's uh, beginning to level off now. We see with the invasion, the so-called invasion, I would say, of uh, Crimea, that the, the, san the sanction regime has bitten a little bit. But, but it hasn't really collapsed the Soviet, the, uh, the Russian state. For anyone who's interested, again, I'll leave this document with uh, Alexander, but um, we really need to study who Vl Vladimir Putin is and what he's not. Uh, he's not the man who de democratized Russia. He's not the leader who created corruption and kleptocracy in Russia. He's not a criminal leader who ordered the murder of opponents. Uh, we get so much negative propaganda about him. He did not order, order the hacking of the DNC servers. Uh, he's not anti-US or anti-West from the get-go. He's not a neo-Soviet leader. He's not an aggressive foreign policy leader. He's not somehow defined by his years at the KGB. What he has done is to rebuild, stabilize, and modernize Russia in a way to prevent future collapses. He's restored the vertical power, managed democracy, that is, restored order. He needed a consensual history, patching up czarist Soviet and post-Soviet eras without imposing one single version of history. He needed Western support to modernize the Russian economy. He wanted Russia to be a great power, not a superpower. He never favored Iron Curtain isolationism. He's an internationalist. And we can go on and on with that. And we find similar situations in China. Uh, we also have countries by military expenditures. We see the US outpaces everyone by a large degree. And this is a very interesting quote. Uh, 
when a movement's instituted by the lodge, uh, working in connection with the fourth root race, it will also be part of the stimulator process and will result in the rendering radioactive of some of the foremost thinkers of that race. Now, this is this applies to the Far East, uh, from China through much of Russia. Uh, the preliminary steps are being taken now, now, and egos are coming in who will endeavor to direct the energies of this race onto the right line through the peak of the cycle of stimulation until the middle of the next century, this century. So with this stimulation, we can also see why China has made such uh, great strides in recent history. We're seeing a shift from geopolitics to biosphere consciousness. And China is spearheading this as well. Then we have the problem of culture and mass media, its gifts, manipulations. We have uh, the mass media propaganda machine that we're seeing in much of the Western press because it's all being concentrated in the hands of a few corporations. With all the connections, uh, all the smart devices we have, uh, the deep state or the surveillance state has has the ability to spy on us. Um, and here's a statement about the U.S. A great future lies ahead of that nation, not because of material power or commercial efficiency. The reason lies in a deeply spiritual, innate idealism, enormous humanitarian potentiality above all else because the version and non effete stock of largely peasant and middle class origin it's determining the destiny of the race. Now with the sixth ray personality of the US, this is going to be uh, the materialism of the country is going to take a, a long time or a very hard uh, lesson to, to break the hold of the materialism, which also means the uh, military industrial complex but the one the one thing we really need to get to I know I've, I've run way out of time here the biggest thing facing the whole world now the reason that all nations need to um, cooperate uh, instead, of stand, instead of standing off against each other is because of climate change, and it is real. Uh, and there's a quote to that regard. Uh, the Maha Chohan, uh, the, the occult minister of culture, is working specifically at this time with the Davis of the Gassies plane. Uh, this is in connection with the destroying work there to effect by the end of this root race in order to, to liberate the spirit of, uh, from constricting forms. Uh, serious disturbances may be looked for in California before the end of the century and in Alaska likewise. Uh, we haven't seen the very serious seismic activity, but what we do see instead is climate change, uh, the Davis of the gaseous subplane. The thing that's not really realized about global warming is it changes the water cycles of the Earth. Uh, for every degree of temperature increase, the, the atmosphere sucks up 7% more moisture from the ground. The heat forces the extra moisture into the clouds, so we get more concentrated precipitation, more violent storms, but they are infrequent, throwing off the water cycle of the Earth. We get blockbuster snows, greater spring floods, more prolonged cycles of drought, monster hurricanes, and typhoons. We're in the sixth extinction cycle on the Earth. Over the next seven decades, we could lose over half the species of animals. Sea ice melts are changing the ocean currents. It will cause storms we cannot imagine by the end of the century if it continues. And to arrest the worst of the climate change, we have to be off carbon as a fuel within 40 years. So we see there's a little bit before us. Uh, and if there's anything that will unite us um, as humanity, as a species, as nations, it will be this, it will be climate, because it's something we can't ignore. Uh, so 
over the to to conclude this and open it up to questions what we're looking at is a complete rethink of our economic political uh, cultural systems uh, the tech sector sector is leading the the way into the next industrial age it's already upon us we who are alive now those who are being born now are taking us in into this age uh, leading up to 2025 what we can expect to see probably is uh, a flare-up somewhere that will make the u.s realize that it's not going to any longer be the major world uh, or the one world power so we are definitely moving toward the the multipolar world that's talked about in the the coming world order uh, the generation that's being born now has, has this uh, sort of biosphere consciousness. Uh, they're very concerned about animal welfare, for instance, about the use of water, the use of resources, um, not driving cars, for instance, uh, car sharing. Uh, it's, a, it's a fascinating period in which we live. It's also very disconcerting for those of us who grew up with the old Piscean model, the vertical alignment, the the search for control and power, the centralization, all that's being destroyed right before our eyes. And the, the two major powers that are, are leading the charge are China and Russia. And yet all we hear in the news, uh, the Western news, is how their aggressors, their their revisionist powers, so on and so forth. Uh, the negative propaganda is just appalling. We need another look, uh, a saner look at these countries. Uh, we need to look at countries like Venezuela, welcome them into the fold. Uh, we need to stop rattling sabers at North Korea and let the Koreans decide their own fate, so on and so forth. Um, there's so much more we could say, but with that, uh, I'll open the uh, I'll open the floor to questions. Um, and thanks for listening. Thank you, Malvin. Um, it's very big volume of uh, impressions. Uh, we don't have. Mm, much time for the questions but if anyone would like to um, comment uh, or uh, share some thoughts or questions please uh, we have a few minutes before we go into meditation um, i want to ask you we are now in the fifth day of the full moon period uh, it's a day of distribution so what topic would you you would suggest us to focus on in our meditation that we could use this opportunity of the full moon and opportunity of our circle there are like 55 50 people gather it now almost here so what would you suggest us to bring our collective focus in this meditation um <clears throat> i would suggest uh, the the unity of nations uh, and the lessening of uh, military confrontation. There is a question uh, from John. Uh, you, you mentioned that China is moving from a geopolitical model to, to a climate resource type model. Could you clarify that and just briefly repeat the title of the new model? Well, the world is moving from uh, a geopolitical model, uh, which is based on militarism, uh, the the grabbing of resources the the control of resources by certain sectors to a more uh biosphere consciousness uh the realization that we all have to work together the realization that we only have limited resources and uh, china in terms of energy is starting 
to recognize, especially with its pollution levels in its cities, that uh, reliance on fossil fuels is not the way to go. So they're strongly promoting renewable energy, especially along their Belt and Road Initiative pro uh, projects. Uh, they also have the problem of their massive population. Uh, they're they're going to be subject to scarcity of water, so they're they're very much aware. The leadership is very much aware that uh, they can't keep going along the old model. They have to to innovate. Um, I mean the 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 key phrase, the the esoteric motto of China is "I indicate the way," and they're indicating the way right now. They're coming more into their sole sort of um, modality. Thank you. Okay. Uh, one more question uh, from Susan. Uh, astounding, well researched and represented. Many thanks. Controversial uh, ruminations on Putin. What is are your sources references for these thoughts on him? And I back up this question. That's I can sign with that question too. Yes. This. Um... These opinions are the more scholarly uh, researches into the man, uh, people who have actually been to Russia, who have studied Russian history, who have um, who have a, a deep insight into Russia and its and its culture. Uh, the, the presentation, the the points that were presented, were actually from a lecture by uh, Stephen Cohen, who is probably America's foremost Russian or a scholar on Russia. Uh, and in listening to Putin myself, uh, listening dispassionately away from the propaganda, uh, a lot of what he says actually reflects uh, what we're moving toward in, in the Aquarian world order. And, uh, he doesn't he doesn't really want confrontation. He, he knows what can come from it. Um, he wants Russia to be a strong nation, naturally, but he doesn't want to dominate anyone from what I can understand. Um, he is a man who is who inherited uh, a broken system and he's had to employ certain means to, to bring Russia to the state where it is in terms of its economy, its military, the the spending that Russia has made on its military has been to bring it up to speed rather than to become aggressive. Uh, and of course, uh, especially in Washington, any upgrading of military in Russia is seen as aggression. Uh, we have to look past the propaganda. The Russia is a country in transition, as is China. Uh, it has vast resources. Uh, Putin has said that he wants to share these resources. Uh, his military posturing is has been defensive. He is a, a reactive leader. He's not so much uh, an aggressive leader. Uh, I would suggest that anyone who has held negative views about the man to research the to research much further and to look at the reality rather than what we hear in the Western press. Uh, you, I'll leave Marvin. it at that. Um, I will unmute Vera. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you for the presentation. It, it was a breath of fresh air to hear from somebody who uh, is brave enough to to see things as as they are and pass the propaganda which is holding really has a great hold on people's minds thank you very much thank you thank you vera um christina i will unmute you please unmute yourself hello hello can you hear me hello yes yeah uh, Thank you so much for this. I agree with the last speaker too. And um, I hear your Southern accent. I'm here in Michigan. Um, of course, what I'm about to say 
should be to this crowd. In the esoteric world, uh, and it has been actually reported that the idea of nuclear bombs and nuclear weapons are going to be no longer uh, allowed by the masters. Uh, I don't know if that's something that's come through you. And of course, the same is true about the true quality of Putin. Um, those in the know uh, know that, of course, he is a good chess player, but he has the protection of the other, you know, uh, of the realm that we are trying to, to deal with. Uh, I live in a county that's dependent upon uh, weaponry. Uh, the economy is so important and um, I'm personally not sure how to address that. Uh, it would certainly send, you know, the wrong message if I, I just blurt this out. And this is the problem that we all have. We who know what, you know, is expected of us don't know how to handle what is in the propaganda, in the, you know, in the mainstream news. Any thoughts? <laughs> yeah, this is, um, this is part of the, go ahead. Um, Thank you, Christine. I know we're limited on time. Yeah, I just suggest uh, we um, be conscious about time and use our opportunity that we're here together to use for meditation. So, uh, uh, Malvin, Okay. your response and uh, any last words leading us into meditation that would focus us on that topic that you suggested for meditation and please the floor is yours to lead us in meditation okay uh just very briefly we we have to look past our differences we we have to see that we're all in the same boat that uh, we're all facing the same crises and that whatever happens to us uh, as a nation happens to everybody and whatever happens to the the world's nations happens to everybody uh, so on that note um, we need to see things in truth uh, not through our glamours uh, which pisces uh, is meant to dispel. So with that, we'll begin the meditation. Okay, so we begin with an alignment. We align ourselves with the, uh, of, we align our triple personality with that of the soul. So we'll take just a brief moment to do that. Just a few deep breaths. We move to the identification with the soul and with our group, the soul being group conscious. So we see all the souls within our group, within our circle here. We extend this identification to the new group of world servers, the group who links humanity to hierarchy. As a group, we project a line of light towards the spiritual hierarchy of the planet, the planetary heart, and we visualize it reaching the ashrams of the masters, and the Christ, the heart of the hierarchy.
that being done together we affirm the sons of men are one and we are one with them we seek to love not hate we, we seek to serve not exact due service we seek to heal not hurt let pain bring due reward of light and love let the soul control the outer form and life and all events and bring to light the love which underlies the happenings of the time let vision come and in insight let the future stand revealed let inner union demonstrate and outer cleavage is be gone let love prevail let all men love The motto of Pisces is, I leave the Father's home, and turning back, I serve. With that as a seed thought, we meditate on the aspect of the divine plan, which now seeks to manifest owing to the inflow of the energies of, of Pisces, in which we now stand. And using the creative you imagination visualize these energies pouring and anchoring upon the earth reinforcing the light the love and the will for the service of the good together we affirm in the center of all love we stand from that center we the souls we turn outward from that center we the ones who serve will work may the love of the divine self be shed abroad in our hearts through the groups and throughout the world In relation to our understanding and to the responsibilities that we need to assume, let us visualize the work to be done now in our life environment to contribute to the advancement of the divine plan. So we'll take a few minutes to do these visualizations. from the hierarchy through our soul groups in the nation in every nation of the world we visualize the light that binds nations instead of divides them we see the light of the light the light of the Christ bringing peace We see the people of goodwill everywhere linked together for the healing of nations, for the healing of the planet.
visualize the light, the love, and the will from the spiritual hierarchy pouring through the five planetary major centers, London, Darjeeling, New York, Geneva, and Tokyo, irradiating the consciousness of the whole human race. From this collective point of tension, we sound the great invocation. From the point of light within the mind of God, let light stream forth into the minds of men. Let light descend on earth. From the point of love within the heart of God, let love stream forth into the hearts of men. May Christ return to earth. From the center where the will of God is known, let purpose guide the little wills of men, the purpose which the masters know and serve. From the center which we call the race of men, let the plan of love and light work out and may it seal the door where evil dwells. Let light and love and power restore the plan on earth. Oh. And then slowly we come back into our own consciousness, bringing the light we've just experienced into our daily lives.
Thank you, Malvin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We invite you to join our uh, coming webinars on March 18th. Uh, please join the Pisces New Moon webinar, continuing the work of su meditative support of the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. This time we will focus on goal six, clean water and sanitation. And on March 20th, we invite you to join the Equinox Festival celebration. We together will celebrate the beginning of the new cycle, the new astrological year cycle, and the 2025 coordination group will share the program for the next annual cycle. Thank you again. Let's stay connected.